Greetings my friends, how are you doing? This is Zeb from Zeb Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So today in this video I am joined by a dear friend of mine, Owen Thomas. Owen, how are you doing? Good to see you man. You too as well, thank you for having me down your workshop. No worries buddy, no worries. So we are in the west of England in the county of Herefordshire, which is just on the border of Wales, is that correct? Yeah, that's right, yeah. That's it, so we're in the west of England um, and I'm here and Owen has kindly invited me down to his workshop uh, to spend some time with him filming this video and a second video to accompany it. Now, if you're not familiar with Owen, Owen is a professional green woodworker who teaches and practices green woodworking on a full-time basis. Um, how long have you been involved in the green woodworking space? Um, probably seven, seven years or so. Maybe, right. maybe a little bit more. I started as, I started as, uh, as a hobby. Right. Um, and now I just got more and more involved in it. Right, it sucks you in. Yeah, it gets pretty, addictive. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> it gets addictive. Someone help. Yes. <laughs> so, Owen, uh, I've known for a few years now. Uh, he teaches uh, a lot of workshops and seminars at the predominant Greenwood Work and Spoon Carving uh, related events throughout the UK. And uh, for a long time, I've been admiring Owen's work. I own some of Owen's work myself. Uh, he's a very well respected green woodworker. Now, what he's very kindly allowed me to do in this video, part one, is allowing me to document in a lot of detail his process that he does to carve a cow spoon. Now, don't worry if you're not familiar with what a cow spoon is. Shortly, we'll be looking at an example, and you know, Owen will talk a little bit about the background of the spoon itself. So, I'm really excited because I believe at the time I'm making this video, this is going to be one of the if not the only detailed tutorial available on youtube currently that goes into the entire process i'm very grateful that owens allowed me to come down here and document this uh, for you to learn from so without further ado i hope you enjoy the rest of this video where owen thomas is going to be teaching you how to carve a cow spoon so owen just before we get into the actual meat and bones of the video and looking at the cow spoon and then the actual tutorial, um, a little bit about your background then. So green woodworking, you said, what, about six, seven years you've been involved? Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, so I started, I started as a hobby um, while I was working as a, as a joiner, a carpenter. Um, so that, that, was, that was probably about eight years ago was the first time I ever actually did um, any green woodworking. Um, and I went shortly after shortly after I started I went on a class with Mike Abbott um, made myself a rocking chair which you, you sat in earlier for lunch um, then the, 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 the summer after I went on that class I actually um, I applied to be Mike's assistant for the for the season uh, so I spent six months living up at Brookhouse Wood and learning, learning about chair making, and learning how to teach chair making as well. Um, and as it happened, one of the other people who spent a bit of time up there while I was there was Barn, who you may know as Barn the Spoon. Um, and shortly after leaving, um, shortly after leaving Mike's, I started working as Barn's apprentice at his shop in London just after it opened. Um, and ever since then, yeah, I've been doing some sort of green, some sort of green woodworking. Um, I've been doing it, I think, five, uh, four, between four and five years. I'll have been doing it uh, full time. So a combination of teaching and uh, teaching and making. Um, I predominantly turn bowls, but I also make a lot of spoons. And so that is that is a big thing you're known for, isn't it? The turning, uh, turning bowls and uh, um, containers and whatnot. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think I think probably most people know me as a bowl turner, um, but I have been I've been carving spoons about the same length of time as I've been turning bowls. Um, so probably both both of them probably seven seven years or so. I was just, when I started. I was just I just uh, I wanted to do everything. I wanted to learn how to do everything, you know. Um, so I tried a bit of it. I tried a bit of everything. Um, but uh, like the, the bowl turning's all been self-taught. Um, but 
the spoon carving, I mostly learned, or learned pretty much everything I know from barn. Lovely. And so would you say your kind of focus is primarily spoon carving and turning? If those are your two main fortes. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So Owen, to begin with, for those that may not be familiar with the cow spoon, um, could you talk a little bit about his background? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so cowl is a Welsh stew. Um, the cowl spoon was what they used uh, used to eat it with. Um, as you might hopefully you'll be able to see, um, it has quite a large. It has a large bowl, but the 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 top of it is flat because it's designed for uh, for for carrying liquids rather than. Um, scooping something into your mouth it's it's designed it's designed to pick up pick up liquid soup um it's quite a large they tend to have quite large um quite large bowls so you can get a decent uh decent mouthful as well um the old handles was similar to this similar to this one they tended to be quite uh, quite thin and quite long um, some were quite long, were, uh, were longer than this than this one. This one, this was a pretty short, short version um, of a cow spoon. Um, they had a few um, particular details that seem fairly common through uh, through most of the older ones that I've seen. Um, so vi visually, they look kind of looks like the bowl and the handle. Are, um, are separate pieces by, by which I mean um, that they're, they're not uh, they don't like flow in like you see some of the Swedish um, the old Swedish spoons have have um, curves so that ev um, everything kind of meets in with each other whereas the vast vast majority of cow spoons that I've seen have got this junction point at the back uh, of the bowl and same same on the back rather than um rather than sweeping curves like uh as you see on a lot of old swedish woodenware um it's kind of a junction so it's almost like the ha the like the handle has been um put onto the bowl and in terms of the woods was there a particular preference for the woods that were used um i think a lot of the old ones were sycamore um, certainly the ones I've seen at St Fagan's Museum uh, which is near Cardiff and you should go if you like uh, old wooden stuff because it's a, it's a great museum um, a lot of them are sycamore I, 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 there is a percentage number floating around in, on the internet I can't remember exactly what it is but it's a pretty high percentage that are, that are sycamore um, Sycamore is quite co very common wood um, in the areas where they were made. Um, it's, very, it's actually quite a common wood around Herefordshire as well. Um, but it's also so that was probably that was probably the 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 the, the main uh, reason for using sycamore is because it's very easy to get hold of because um, they were making vast vast amounts of spoons. And was this across all of Wales, or was it just a particular part of Wales? Um, I, th from what I can tell, or from what I know, um, it does seem to be fairly. Uh, there does seem to be a quite a good spread. Um, there's other types of spoons that do seem to be slightly more localized, um, but um, as far as I know, yeah, they do. They do tend to be fairly. Um, fairly fair, they there does seem to be a, a fair spread of, of where of where they've come from well i'm not as much as i'm in um as much as i'm an expert in carving them um i'm not an ex a complete expert in the history of them. <laughs> but it's a beautiful spoon i really really like it yeah i really like them i mean i started carving these and uh, the dolphin spoons which you will see in the next video uh because it was something different to carve. Um, at the time when I started, or I was starting to look at um, carving spoons to sell, um, 
everyone was carving Swedish style spoons and I thought that it would be nice to nice to carve something from my own kind of heritage and nice to be carving something that's different uh, so the what I actually carve they're not they're not copies of uh, of old ones they're not um, they're not replicas um, they but they are very much well they're very much my own design but they are very much referencing um, the old style of spoon and so essentially you just developed it basically to yeah over 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 a few over a few years I, was, I, start, I started carving them and they I think the old the older uh, versions of what I was carving were a lot more similar to the uh, traditional ones um, but these one what I what I make now um, they are um, I'd consider these to be to be a design that I've come up with. I've not seen any old, um, I've not seen any old versions of of a spoon that looks like this. But but I kind of feel like if this if if we transplanted this back a hundred years ago, people would still recognise it as a cow spoon. And that's kind of that's why I uh, that's how I feel about it. So to begin the process, what's the first thing we're going to be doing? Uh, so the first thing we're doing is splitting out a billet for ourselves to make the spoon out of. Um, with all the spoons I make, I tend to use uh, radially cleft wood. So for those of you out there who don't know what that is, I will be splitting the wood along this lot uh, in half here. And then taking another split and using this a wedge shape bit of wood out of there, which is along the radius of the wood, so radially cleft. Um, there's a lot of arguments in the spoon world about um, whether you should use um, half half logs or uh, sorry half half branches or radially cleft wood. Which one's better? Um, Personally, I don't. I've never really, apart from uh, bentwood spoons, where the where the spoon follows the grain perfectly. I've not found either to be stronger than the other, um, and because I use the same, I buy the same wood for spoons as I do for bowl turning. I carve everything out of radially cleft wood because it means I can just buy a bunch of logs that are the same kind of size. It makes it a lot easier for me. Uh, to to get hold of the wood. And do you have a preference of the type of wood that you're using? Um, generally speaking, I like to use sycamore um, because it's uh, as I said earlier, it's, it's it's actually quite pretty easy to get hold of it around here. Um, I'm using birch today because I'm very low on green. I'm very low on green sycamore. It's a bit too it's a bit too dry for carving spoons. It's, uh, it's still okay for bowls, but it's a little bit too far gone for, for carving spoons by hand. Gotcha. So with this one now, we're now going to uh, uh, split this uh, into its uh, billet then, basically. Yep, yep. Ready? So each time I'm splitting, I'm uh, trying to go in half, pretty much in half. Uh, okay. Um, I find that if you if you split, and trying to split stuff directly in half, it's more likely that the um, that the splits kind of run straight. It's less less likely to veer off to one side. Uh, right. So I'm just going to remove the point from this. Right. Always split from the smaller end. And now I'm gonna, so this face here is what I'm gonna use for the spoon. So now I'm gonna take about 
20 mil, just under an inch. And that's what, um, that's how deep our spoon's gonna be. There we go. That's all the splitting done. So now we will move on to the next stage. So with the billet, what is the next step in the process? Uh, well, the next step for me is to draw around my towel spoon template. Now with the template, um, you've kindly set up a page, haven't you, on your website where people can actually download a copy? I have, I have indeed, yeah, because um, I'm just that generous. <laughs> um, I use templates because um, because of the way I work and the way I the, and the way I sell my work um, means that it's very helpful to be um, starting from the same point every time. So rather than um, rather than guessing every uh, guessing every time I, I get the axe out and I like to know well because I know where my finish point is going to be means I can I know where the best place to start is if I'm using a template. So it gives you an element of uniformity, basically. Yeah, yeah. Because, 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 because yeah, because of because of how I sell, um, it helps to be it helps to have an uh, an amount of consistency because otherwise I'd be um, I'd be photo having to photograph every individual spoon because it would be different. Um, the template lets me um, takes a bit of the thinking out of the a little bit of the thinking out of the process at the at the beginning. So it helps me it helps me get on and helps me get a more um, it helps me get to a more uniform end, uh, if that makes sense. So a reminder to those of you that are watching, there is a link below this video taking you to a page on Owen's website and on there you can download this template. So with a template on the billet now, what are you going to be doing? Uh, so for the first stage, what I try and do is line the uh, line the center up with the grain. So I don't want to be um, having short grain in the handle. So I try and make sure that it's uh, that it's in line. And then I use a uh, sharpie or felt tip pen. Other brands are available. Um, to go round. Oh. So do you have a preference with like a sharpie type of pen as opposed to like a pencil? Yeah, and I will tell you for why. Um, the At this point, we're axing. Um, that means, what well, is axing, though you still have to be, um, you still have to be precise with what you're doing, it's not a finished cut. Um, if you, it's not that difficult to make a make a slight miss hit with an axe. And that sort of two two three mil line around the template is quite often it's enough to give you a little bit of um, a buffer. Yeah, a little bit of a, a little bit of a buffer, a little bit of safety. Um, you know, you. I'm sure. I'm sure. I've um, I've saved many a spoon. By having that little buffer zone there um, to work to. Um, what I, once I've finished, once I've done the axing, um, I tend to put the template back on again before I start the knife work, and then I go around it in a, with a pencil or a, a or a you know like a biro fi a finer pen, um, because that's the point where I'm wanting to get exact uh, the exact shape um, and. Even though I still, even though I've got, I do have quite a lot of experience carving spoons. Um, I'm still awful at um, getting shapes even without a template. <laughs> no. It's just, it's just, it's just something that is just something that doesn't seem to happen for me. Um, but yeah, anyway, this is uh, that's the template. That's what we're going to be aiming to get to with the axe. So with the template marks out, what's the next step in the process? Uh, well, the ne next step is uh, is the axe work. So I'm just going to, um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'm going to start working 
and as I'm working through, I'll um, do my best to explain what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And what is your personal axe that you're using? Uh, this is a uh, Wetterlings, uh, Wetterlings Wildlife Hatchet, I think. Oh, interesting. The Wetterlings version of, of, of a wildlife hatchet. Um, at the time, I got it because it was about 20 quid cheaper than the Grand Force one, but very similar. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think they make these anymore. I don't think Wetterlings actually make axes anymore, or do they? Um, they got bought out, didn't they, by bought, Grand I think Sports. they got bought out by Grand Sports, yeah. so I'm not sure you can get these anymore. But it, it, it's, a, it's a wildlife hatchet. Um, with a pimped-up handle. With a pimped-up handle. Yeah, I find um, it's, still, it's still... It's the handle that, um, that came with it. But I, I like to have facets on my tall handles rather than sat, um, smooth ones because mm -hmm. I find it easier to grip for, especially if I'm using them for a long, uh, for a long period of time. So I just um, all I did was take the corners off, but it's I find it more comfortable. It's easier to easier to grip. Uh, so f first thing I'm going to do, I'm just going to start by getting the billet to the right width because we're, we're a little bit wide here. So yes, yeah, starting off with pretty gentle cuts there, just because I'm they're a bit more uh, require a bit more accuracy because you don't want to be losing uh, losing width right out of the gate. Um, but now we can work on thinning down a bit for the handle. Um, so I'm going to take taking a lot of relief cuts along there just to remove a bunch of material. So that's a good start. Um, the next bit I do is I actually start to um, shape the back of the bowl a little bit. This helps a lot if you're if you've ever spent any any amount of time spoon carving, you'll know that the knife work's not the easiest thing to do. So if you can do uh, if you can do the work with a tool that's going to get it off quicker, you might as well take the opportunity to do it. Um, the important thing to remember when you're doing that, uh, doing the, the back part of the bowl, is that you don't want to go too close to the top face with the, uh, with the rounding. You, need to, you want to leave a bit of flat there because we need to, um, in, in a little bit, we'll cut the crank in. Uh, for the, so that the, hand, the handle's angled to the bowl. Um, if you thin that out all the way to the edge, you're going to um, not have enough wood there to, to make, it, um, make it a good shape. Um, right. The next part I'm going to do is work the handle a bit more and work these shoulders. Um, this is a slightly... Well, this is one of the most helpful things that um, that Barn taught me. It's a bit of an advanced axe technique. I'll start working in this way. So you can quite possibly see I'm using I'm actually using the wrong face of the axe um, to work around that line takes a bit of getting used to. Um, so if you're not super confident with your axe, it's probably safest not to do it until you um, get a little bit um, more comfortable with it.
So when you're coming back down the handle, uh, it's very important that you really slow down when you come towards the back of the bowl because it's very easy um, to put little micro micro cracks in it if you tap if you're tapping it with the axe or even if you just slip and hit it um, you'll lose the side of the bowl. Uh, some people like to put a, a relief cut in with a saw um, which is a perfectly legitimate technique. Um, I think it, some people have an idea that's sort of cheating a little bit, but um, it's not. Okay, so now I'll work on the other side. There we go over here. So we do the same process on the other side. So that's one of the reasons that I try and line the handle up uh, with the grain as well. It means I can I can use um, if I'm using nice straight grained wood, I can get my axe in there and uh, split quite a lot of material off without having to carve it. Again, that's a bit of that's a more uh, a, a more advanced technique I seriously don't recommend trying it if you're not super duper comfortable with your axe because there is a there is a, a little bit of danger inherent in doing that a little bit more here remembering to be very careful Okay, so as far as the basic shape goes, that's pretty good. Uh, next phase I'm going to do is uh, dealing with the front of the bowl. So we're just going to shape that in roughly. Um, so what I start by doing, rather than trying to take off all that material in one go with an axe, I'm going to take an angle off on the corner. Can you see that um, it reduces the amount of material that's there? It means that so there's less to take off, so it means I don't have to hit the axe, uh, hit with the axe so hard, uh, which means that I'm going to have more control. Hopefully you can see that I am uh, that the axe is actually staying in position in the same place, and it was the uh, the spoon that I was uh, tilting round. Uh, you get a lot of control from uh, working like that rather than trying to axe sideways around a around a curve. Next job is to cut the crank uh, into the bowl. So for those of you who don't know what a crank is, it is the angle between the handle and the bowl that, um, that kind of makes it uh, makes the spoon work and makes you be able to hold it um, at an, a good angle rather than having to twist your wrist. Uh, so for these spoons, it's slightly different to uh, eating spoons because the point of the where the uh, the point where the handle um, meets the flat of the bowl is a lot further back with so with eating spoons generally speaking the uh, the point where the the point where the bowl starts turning upwards is normally about half well it's at the widest point of the bowl so it would be here 
But with these spoons, because we have a flat rim, the point or the lowest point of the spoon is actually at the back of the bowl here. So to start with, I use the point of the axe to break up some of the fibers in the middle of the bowl. That's just to make sure that when I'm axing down the handle, um, this piece of wood doesn't split away all the way through, um, through the front. So I've got a handy little notch in my uh, chopping block here. So I can rest that in there so it's nice and secure. So I take quite a steep cut in there. Like so. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to flip the spoon round. I'm going to make a cut in this way to meet it. So make sure, make sure you're keeping your hand as far back as you can. So I still have a bit of a flat on the top, but that's uh, on the front, but that's fine. So I've now got the crank in there. It's going to provide provide that uh, nice angle. Um, so now what I need to do is just form uh, form in the back. Now because the handle is going to be quite narrow. What I like to do is make a sort of a progressive taper like this, rather than a rather than a, a, a sharp angle like so. We want to have a nice even taper from this point here at the bottom of the bowl all the way along the handle. That's how you get the maximum strength out of the wood. I don't normally mark it, that was just um, for uh, explanation. Okay. deep so there are some alternatives to axing this part you can um, you can do it all by knife if you want or if you're lucky enough to have a shave horse or a spoon mule you can shape the front of it with the front of this with a draw knife, which can um, make things easier as well. But for for now, that's the axing done. The next stage is I just start to do the hollowing with an adz. Uh, the next stage of the uh, of the spoon is I just start off the. Uh, hollowing of the bowl with um, a little adz. Um, I just find it speeds up the process quite a lot. Uh, so I always start adzing in from the front of the bowl. Um, the danger, if you if you start with the back, the danger is you can 
just um, catch under the grain and ping that whole front off. So if you start in this way, that shouldn't happen. Is this something if people don't have an ant they can do just with a spoon knife? Oh yeah, the, the majority majority of people will just do it with a spoon knife, and it's not um, it's not a case if you have to have an ads. Um, I'm not yeah, I'm not I'm not saying you should go out and buy an ads just so well, you can everyone do that. needs an excuse to find I mean, more tools now. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it's if you need an excuse like this is a this is a really wicked excuse to go and buy yourself an ads, <laughs> but. Um, you know, it's, I mean, it saved me, I don't know, a couple of minutes. But if you're trying to, you know, if I'm, when I'm making these in, in, in bulk, so may, normally what I do is I try and make between 10 and 15 over a day. And when you've got, five, um, or even 10, 10 lots of, 10 lots of two minutes um, saved, it, you know, it, it all adds up when you're when that's how when that's how you're working. Cool. So with the ads in done, what's the next step in the process? Uh, next step is get the knives out and do a bit of not be a bit of uh, carving. Perfect. So what is the next step in the process? All right, the next stage before we start um, start carving with the knives, um, I'm just going to redraw uh, the template. Redraw around the template, like I said, uh, like I said earlier. Uh, but this time, I'm going to use a pencil, so we get a uh, we get a finer line, so it's closer to the shape to the actual shape that we're aiming for. So it's quite faint. No, I, I mean, I can I can see it. I don't know if the camera's picking it up. Um, but that'll just be a good guide. Well, it's not the end of the world if you um, if you deviate from the template, but even just as a guide, it's really it's a really helpful thing to have on there and making making sure it's fit, you know that you what you're doing is fairly even and. So the next step in the process, are you now going to begin using the straight knife? That's it, yeah. So I'm going to start by um, getting the getting the top view close to where we're um, where we're aiming for. So I, um, so it, it, it um, so it's the size that I've got for the template. Uh, then I'll start. I actually start the hollowing um, after, uh, for the bowl after that because I. To my mind, the bowl is the most important part of the spoon. That's the bit that you really need to get right. So, um, so if you've got the bowl right, the rest of the spoon is going to be grand. Uh, so you should build build your spoon off of the bowl rather than making the handle first and then hollowing at the end. And your knife, what is your preferred uh, use of straight knife? Um, so I use a more... Uh, uh, 106. Um, I, I find them, yeah, they, they're, they're really good knives. You can't beat them for the money. Um, you can see I've modified the handle a little bit, similar to how, I, um, how I've done my axe, um, just because I find it easier to grip uh, something with, um, with chunky facets. But this is literally, that's literally just a little, little shaving off it's still the same shape as the factory Mora handle. But it just gives it a more defined facet, basically. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, yeah, it, it, um, I found when I was doing, you know, days on days of, of spoon carving, I was starting to get, um, I was starting to get blisters because I was having to grip onto it mm -hmm. so much. Um, but when I started doing this, they all, um, 
that that stopped that stopped happening. Um, okay, ready. Okay, so I'm starting with a controlled pull cut around the edge. It's very important if you're doing this to make sure that your thumb is um, well out of the way. So I'm just trying to get down uh, to the line of my template. I'm not exactly aiming for a for the finished um, surface at this at this point. I'm just trying to get um, get the get the rough shape so I can start getting the hollow in for the bowl. As I said, um, the bowl the bowl dictate the bowl is going to dictate where everything else goes. Cuts in at the neck. I'll do. Right. So now I'm going to put the straight knife away and get my spoon knife out. Oh, look at that! It's showing off now. Showing off, yeah. <laughs> shiny, shiny. So, what is this you're using here for those that may not be familiar? Okay, so this knife is known as a Tooker Cam. Um, this particular one is made by Nick Westerman, who I am sure a lot of you know of. And if you know of him, you're probably all super jealous that I've got one of these. Um, basically, they are a, they are a, a larger version of a regular spoon knife. So this is a this is a wood tools um, spoon knife. So you can obviously you can see there's a massive difference in in size, but the most important thing about the Tooker Cam and the reason I like it and uh, the reason that I know a lot of people like them for production carving is that the rather than a um, what do they call it an, an asymmetric curve like these uh, like these tools and most of the other smaller spoon knives. Um, the Tooker Cam has got a fixed radius all the way around. So that means what, at whatever point of the knife you're cutting, it's always going to be the same radius. For cow spoons, that's really helpful because the bowl is generally round or oval shaped. You can very easily use this tool um, to quite quickly carve carve out an, uh, a, a a round, like, or like a sort of a hemisphere shape. If people don't have this, and once again, they can just use a normal spoon knife. Like oh yeah, abs yeah, absolutely. Um, um, yeah, it's more than. Um, the, I think these are tools that a lot of people want, but I think a lot of you know not everybody really needs one. It's a, it's a nice thing to have, and it's a really useful tool. It is a really useful tool to have, but it's not something that's going to stop you from carving spoons and it's probably and it's probably also not something that's going to make you better at carving spoons it's got um it has its own limitations its limitations are that it it makes the one it makes the one shape that it's designed to make really really well but it doesn't really do any it doesn't really do much else mm -hmm. so if you're looking for something that's versatile and you can do lots of different shapes with it I'd still stick with a well. That's what I'm. You know, that's why I still have those other spoon knives as well. Um, generally, generally, I just use this, especially for these spoons. But sometimes you need uh, you need a knife that's going going to be able to do um, different shapes, different angles. Um, this took uh, took a cams. Any any of the took a cams that are out there, they do the one thing really, really well, better than the spoon knife. But they don't really do anything else. Okay, so 
I'm going to start with the hollow now. So uh, the Tokyo cam works best with a rotating cut. So hopefully you can see that I'm not pulling the knife across the surface. I'm twisting. I'm using my using this hand as a as a pivot point. With my other hand, I'm twisting the handle like that. So I've started with the I've started at the back of the bowl um, for safety reasons, really, um, because this this is quite a it's quite a big tool. It's obviously very sharp. And because you're twisting, you can put quite a lot of uh, force into it. Now, what I don't want to happen is for this knife, for the knife to slip and come uh, anywhere near my hand or my arm. Um, but if you start at the back, you've still got all this material at the front of the bowl. That stop. You can probably you can probably see it's actually stopping. Uh, it's stopping the knife be able to get any further forward. So that's a good safety tip that I picked up. So once I've done those cuts there, I spin it round. Hopefully you can see that I'm keeping um, I'm keeping the spoon and I'm keeping the spoon knife um, really well supported. So the end of the handles on my leg here, uh, the end of the spoons resting on my chest and the bowl of the spoons resting on my leg. So there's no, at no point is anything waving, uh, waving around unsupported in the air. It means that all of the, all of the force I'm putting into the tool um, is going into the blade rather than going towards trying to stabilize everything. You can see I'm starting to get um, fuller cuts now. So with the Tsuka cam, you're basically getting a symmetrical cut, aren't you? All the way through, like an even cut, basically. Yeah, yeah. So that's the basis of well, all the, all the spoons that I make are all based off based from um, the the size of them is all based on the size of this. So I mean that that's that's another thing. Like I was saying that the, the these tools do have um, some limitations. Is you kind of have to um, design your spoons around the tool to some extent. So like this tool, this tool, for example, wouldn't be able to make a narrow, deep, bold spoon. It can, it can do, um, I was trying to show, you know, if you want it deep, your spoon's got to be that wide. Right. If it wants to be shallow, it's got to be that, that wide and so on. So it's all sections of, sections of that, um, sections of a circle. You can do that. Cool. So I think Nick makes other Nick makes um, different sized ones of these. So obviously you can you can you can sort of chop and change and uh, different ones you know different ones do will make different bowl um, will make bowl shapes with different um, proportions. But the um, the funny thing the funny thing with the turkey cams is that the 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 shallower the bowl you want to do. Actually, the bigger the t bigger the knife you need to have, because the radius is a lot more open. Mm -hmm. So now I'm starting to work the starting to work the corners, but you can still see I'm using that twisting motion, and that's that. 
twisting motion is very important to keeping an even bowl size. Kind of making planing cuts. It's very, very crucial that you don't let your th uh, the the pad of your thumb creep over. So I have actually got a um, I don't know if you, I don't know if it will get picked up, but I've got a curved scar there where I made a mistake early on um, in my tuki camming okay so for a roughly shaped bowl that's going to be it so we're back to the straight knife now then? Yeah, back to the straight knife. Um, so I'm going to just work the top of the bowl, make sure that that's nice and flat because that's a good um, datum point, reference point um, for the rest of the spoon. And we know that this is gonna be flat. I'm just taking really small cuts, smaller cut as possible. I'm trying to keep the knife as straight as I can. Um, I'm just sighting from one side of the from one side of the bowl to the other to try and get it flat. A little bit more at the front here. And that is close enough for now. So that's now my datum point. So everything else on the spoon has to uh, fit in fit in with that. Um, so I'm going to start with. I'm going to thin down the handle some. So that's what it's done. I'm only worried about the transition point at the neck at the moment because um, this handle is going to be tapered. All the cuts are going to be um, from the bowl to the end. So I can easily get rid of this later, but this is the bowl ends, the crucial end. Mm -hmm. So should always be moving the spoon, um, twisting, you know, twisting it, turning it, handling it. Um, sometimes I feel when I'm teaching that people are very kind of set on, oh, I, you know, I need to hold. If I'm holding the spoon like this, I need to try and work. So I'm still holding it in the same direction, um, but. It's a lot better if you move. If it's, it's a lot easier if you move it around, and you look, you learn different. You learn different cuts. Um, plus, you can you see it from more uh, from more angles. You see that see how the spoons all coming together from different angles. If I'm just holding it like this and trying to work on it always from from this point, um, you're only going to get like a one dimensional view of it. Or two dimensional. Sorry, two dimensional view of it. Um, but spoons are a three D object, so it's good. It's good to every so often just you know check out how it's going. Like 
Okay, so that's good there now. Um, so now I'm going to start working on the outside of the bowl and try and start bringing bringing all of these surfaces together. Start filming these in 3D, Z, and you could um, <laughs> have uh, we got wood, wood chips pinging at your ping, oh, pinging at your subscribers. Oculus Rift uh, glasses. And, uh, That's it, yeah. Catching them. Right, now we're getting somewhere. So now I'm going to work uh, around the, the back side of this as well. So what I'm trying to, at this point, what I'm trying to think of is that I know this, the handle's gonna progress to about the center there of the bowl, about halfway along the bowl. So when I'm taking material off here, I don't wanna be taking it off from the top. Um, from the top. So I'm gonna stop uh, sort of handle handle width you know I might or not I might I will adjust the shape later but for now it's always certainly while you're roughing things out it's always better to um, uh, to leave yourself a little bit more material than you might actually need just in case you make a mistake Okay, so now we kind of got a, a bit of an idea of uh, where the bowl is going to be, the shape is going to be. So what we want to look at, especially now we're going to we're going to start looking at the handle, the transition into the handle. So for these spoons, I think that this part here where my thumb is that's gonna be the lowest point of the spoon. So that's where the handle starts on these. So the handle wants to be curving back and joining back here. Because as it is, it kind of looks a bit weird now. And pr to be honest, probably wouldn't work that well. So if you imagine that being in a bowl and you're trying to get something from the bottom of the bowl, um, the bottom of the handle is hitting before the bowl gets in there. 
Um, so yeah, we've got a bit to take off here and then taper it into the handle. Cool. So you can see already um, that's made quite a big difference to how, how the spoon looks. Mm -hmm. So before we go too far on that, I'm just going to shape the top of the handle um, into the bowl to make sure we're not making this uh, transition point here too thin. So there are lots of different shapes of bowl and transitions into the handle um, in the old cowl spoons. Uh, my favorite was this one, which is why I do it. That's why I use it on this spoon. So what I'm doing is forming a point on the back of the bowl so what I'm doing is I'm taking a cut in from that direction a cut in there so straight down at the back of the bowl and then the handle gets uh, chamfered And although that's, there's not much difference there, I've not done very much, but you can already see that that makes quite a big, um, visually makes quite a big difference. It, look, it now looks like the bowl is a kind of a separate part than it does the handle. Just taking the top of the handle to a point. Just like that. Now I've got a good idea of what thickness I should uh, what thickness I should have here because so like I said well you can I mean you can see on this where the grain's running if I make this too thin it means there's a very um, there's a lot of there'd be a lot of short short grain here mm -hmm. which would make the handle more likely to split so the longer um, the longer the, more, the longer the grain is in the handle the stronger it's all going to be I used to find it very tempting to make these these kind of tapered handles. It's always really tempting to make them really thin, but they don't need to be. And I don't, I don't think there's any benefit in making them really really thin. And I I like um, a slightly chunkier handle to use anyway. Um,
So now I'm just going to follow this uh, these bevel up the handle. Now there's a lot of different things you can do with a handle um, on a cowl spoon. I, personally, I think the thing that makes it a cowl spoon is the is the bowl, is the flat, the flat top, uh, oval or circle. The handle doesn't really matter so much. So like, yeah, yes, the old the older the uh, the older ones, the majority of them had the had like long tapered handles. But they even even with that, there was a there was a fair amount of um, there was a fair amount of different design on it. Like I, I think probably the n one of the nicer ones that I've seen has um, like a D-shaped handle. So it was flat on the top and uh, curved on the underneath. And it felt really nice in the hand. Um, so now I'm just going to do some bevels on the underneath as well. So doing like these um, doing these bevels with facets, if you if you want to call them that, they're very useful to make it look like you've taken quite a lot of weight off of the spoon. As I say rather rather than a big flat um, a big flat surface there. You've still got the same thickness, so you've still got a you know a good amount of strength there. But because that corner's gone, um, it just it looks lighter. It, it it doesn't look so chunky. Also like to do is to put a little point on the end not really not really pointy point but it just kind of finishes it off nicely and there's um, examples of old ones uh, that have got the tips of them of the handle are sort of are stained and the reason for that is they um, they used to put them in the or when they've used them they'd wash them up um, and then they'd put they uh, spike them into the peat next to the fire to to dry out. Oh, interesting! It's always a fun, fun little story. So I'm just doing a few little cuts there. Normally, would at this point, would you let it dry a little bit before doing your finishing? I would. Yes, I yeah, I, 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 I always. Um, I always dry uh, spoons before finishing them, but for, I mean for the for these cow spoons, there really isn't very much more to do. It, it would be basically repeating the um, going back through the process that I've just done in the same order, um, just with finer cuts and when it's dried. Right. So, would you say this is now done? I would say I would say that this is done. There's still I'd, I'd say it's rough carved done. Yeah, it's not ready for selling yet. But uh, um, so at this point, what would you do? Would you typically let this dry out? Yeah. So I'd I'd let this dry out for um, for a few days, and then I then I can go back over it. Um, I've, I always find I'm sure everyone always finds it's you get a, you get a more of that mirror finish mm -hmm. um, if the wood's dry so it's, it's almost impossible to get that when the uh, when the wood's still as green as this is and the final thing in terms of oiling uh, what are your personal preferences with regards to oiling um, so I use linseed oil um, 
pre-oxidized uh, pre-oxidized linseed oil is what I use. Um, the, the fancy stuff from Sweden, um, which dries. Uh, it dries the same speed. Uh, it dries about as fast as boiled linseed oil does, um, but it doesn't have any of the nasty chemicals in. Right. Technically speaking, you don't you don't actually need to put oil on your spoons. It's, it's completely unnecessary mm-hmm. if you're going to be using them. But uh, the general public, who are the people I, I hope uh, are going to buy my uh, buy my spoons and buy my bowls, always prefer it if it's oiled. Um, so I use linseed oil. Walnut oil is also very good. Um, there's a lot. I'd steer clear of all the vegetable oils um, because, generally speaking, they don't dry. What you want to be looking for is a drying oil. Um, it's pretty. It's not too difficult to go to get up on Google and look for drying oils, food safe drying oils. Um, yeah, um, but they, linseed oils, all you, all you really need. Um, I would don't. I wouldn't ever wax a spoon, or um, because um, if, especially if you're using it for something like uh, like like one of these, you would be using for soup or stew. And they're going to be that's going to be hot, so the wax be you know wax doesn't um, stay solid under any sort of te- under any sort of temperature really. So it's just gonna it's just gonna come out, and um, your food's gonna taste a beeswax. <laughs> Perfect. So there you go, my friends. That is a wrap for this detailed tutorial in which Owen Thomas taught you how to carve a cow spoon. Owen, thank you so much. No worries, man. Good to have you. A sincere pleasure once again. Thank you for having me down here. Um, A couple of things to mention. Uh, I'm going to put two links in the description below this video. One link is going to be to a page on Owen Thomas's website. And on that page, what Owen Thomas has very kindly done is provided you a free template for you to download and work with as shown in this video. Um, a template really does help out quite a bit. So if you're something that you do want to go out there and attempt yourself, which I know Owen's intention was with this video to inspire you to go at this and give this a try, then do go check that out. On that page also, there's something I do want to mention. I know, and I, I would genuinely speak for myself here, uh, when I'm carving spoons and I'm first learning certain techniques, is I found that the moment I started to look at other people's work and not copy, but just get inspiration, look up close and personal in terms of how they've done certain things. I know it really uh, improved my own uh, spoon carving. So what I'm gonna do is on that website also, uh, there will be information because you do actually sell these spoons as well, don't you? Yeah. They're very popular spoons. I know when Owen sells these at uh, uh, festivals throughout the UK, they're very, very popular. So on that page, and once again, it's just an entirely optional thing that if you feel uh, actually buying a spoon and actually kind of looking at it so you can see up close and personal all the work that goes into it, it's entirely optional at the very least, it's just there on that page. But at the very least, like I said, the template is there for you to access and for you to download. One thing, um, and this is more of a personal request, if you do visit that website and that page, is Owen does send out a regular newsletter updating you on all the things that he has going on uh, in his workshop and around the UK and also the work that he produces. So it would mean the world to me when you are on that web page to join his email newsletter. He only he would email us out from time to time. Um, and like I said, it's a great way of keeping in touch with Owen and all the work that he gets up to. So a reminder, a link below to a page on his website where you can access the template to download, uh, to try this yourself at home, carving a cow spoon. Secondly, I will put a link below to uh, Owen's Instagram profile because Owen's quite active. Uh, on Instagram, once again sharing the myriad of things he's, he has going on. And like I said, he works in the Greenwoods working space on a full-time basis, both teaching and actually making. So that is a wrap for this uh, video. In the second video, what uh, Owen is very kindly going to be teaching you is how to carve a dolphin spoon. That's it, yeah. That sounds very fancy. Yeah, another YouTube first, probably. It probably is as well. Look at that. Two YouTube first, man. Yeah. Too much excitement for me to handle in one day. <laughs> But seriously, uh, it's going to be a great video. So if that video is already out by the time you're watching this, a link below. So once again, I really do appreciate you watching. I know this is a long video, but as you can see, I only left no stone unturned and showed you the entire process. 
So Owen, a sincere thank you once again for your Brilliant. time and for having me down and for openly sharing uh, your process. Guys, hope you enjoyed this video. Do check out the links below and I'll uh, I shall see you on the next video. And from Owen and myself, we hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. This is Zed from Zed Outdoors. Peace out.